Well, good afternoon, and welcome back from the posters and the awards. It's really a great pleasure to be here, and I am really excited to uh, Are We Ready for Football? The, the Super Bowl is going to be here in about 12 days, 4 hours and 26 minutes, and uh, a few seconds. So I want to talk, I want to sort of think with you this afternoon about what it would be like to be a part of a National Football League team and how they use sports science to transform a team of champions, really expert experts, into a championship team. And I think that relates to what we do in the ICU every day, where we're highly trained at what we do as individuals, and that we have to learn a little bit, perhaps from other professions, about how we might better become a championship team. How could we use the press box the coaches, how could we use instant replay? Can you imagine having instant replay in your ICU where you could look at everything that was done, every medication that was given, and review it in the detail that you see every Sunday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Mondays, actually, on TV with the NFL? I have no financial conflict of interest, and anything that you might see is not to advertise or to promote any of the items that I might project. And I have a lot of acknowledgments because it was through the good graces of Don Smolensky, the president, and James Harris, the chief of staff, and Julie Hershey, the community relations manager of the Philadelphia Eagles in the town that I live in, Philadelphia, that I was able to access and understand a little more about the sports science that they're trying to create. In addition, I graduated from Duke University and Coach K and the basketball um, coaches there were willing to meet with me and talk to me about how they use their incredible tools to evaluate and support, coach, mentor, and win with hopefully a team of champions and not just, uh, excuse me, a championship team and not just a team of champions. Robert Bassam, who has helped to create the NASA uh, space centers, uh, command centers, is going to be with us and in the uh, following discussion will be here as a panel member. And Lucas Wong, who created Beeline Medical and does a lot of live capture of uh, ICU events, has helped me in preparing this, as well as Tor Lairdahl, who really is a disruptive innovationist of, of his own. And we'll talk a little bit about the journey he has had and the aha moments that he shares with us. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Bob Berg and my team at CHOP, who tolerates the incessant uh, disruptive innovations that we try together and is receptive to thinking out of the box. And I do need to disclaim or acknowledge that the opinions expressed here are not intended to represent the official views of the National Football League or anyone other than myself. So come on a little journey with me. Think for a couple of minutes and sort of relax as we think about how do we take a team of champions and create a championship team. If I think to my own hospital at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, more than 40% of our beds at the hospital now are ICU beds, 200 out of 540, including the neonatal intensive care unit. And the number of kids we admit each year equals the entire ICU's uh, yearly ICU admissions of Australia and New Zealand. We have 26 attending, 17 fellows, residents, nurses, nurse practitioners. We have pharmacists. We have um, respiratory therapists and social workers. We have so many people trying to help and form teams. When you do the calculations, that's more than a million, more than one million teams that might respond to a critically ill patient in our ICU every day. How are we going to train them? Perhaps we do have a little to learn from the National Football League. What is disruptive innovation? Disruptive innovation, as Clayton Christensen might describe and writes about, is a change that occurs. It's not an incremental change. It's not a little change. It's not what we do every day with quality improvement, which is very important. But it's that sort of out-of-the-box change, and we might recognize, like the iPhone or other innovations that have changed the way we do business, that have changed the paradigm of care that we give, 
And I'd like to think with you over the next 35 minutes or so about how we might use the learnings of the National Football League to do that. But disruptive innovation is not new to the society. Here's Dr. Peter Saffer, one of our founders, using paralyzed, sedated volunteers to demonstrate the benefit of rescue breathing. He used real people as his simulators. And with the disruptive innovation of joining his friend Asmund Lerdal, who was a doll maker in Norway, he was able to create a realistic enough mannequin, a simple mannequin, that the world could live, the world could learn to deliver effective CPR. It is recognized that since that transition from the lab, from the experiment, from the human simulator to this simple simulator, more than two million lives have been saved with CPR since its, its reinvention. But they didn't stop there. With his friends, he then disruptively innovated to create simple mannequins that were cheap and usable by the nurse midwives and the community healthcare workers in Africa and India to help learn how to give a first breath of life to children, more than one million children who would otherwise die. And on the other end of the spectrum, created very high fidelity mannequins that are computerized and can breathe and can cry and can die and then be resurrected and train hundreds of thousands of trainees each year with high fidelity simulators like seen here at Boston Children's Hospital at their simulator center. But look at our real patients. If you look at the bedsides of our patients, it's quite complex. We see all of the technology. We see all of the things that we need to do and do well. But we have difficulty doing it and doing it well as a team. How are we going to do that? We need a new paradigm. Checklists are not going to be enough. And just like these Philadelphia Eagle football players in the Snow Bowl of 2013, they faced conditions they weren't expecting. They had practiced all week expecting certain temperature conditions. And when they presented on the field, they were forced to perform in a very different environment. How did they respond? They weren't just running their plays in their usual manner. They were adapting. They understood the goal, and they were able to change their patterns of behavior and work as a team, in this case, for a win. And it was both on the basis of the champions, the team members who excelled, and the teamwork. So as Dr. Dellinger did earlier, I'd like to brainstorm with you about 10 things that I think we could learn from football and apply to critical care medicine. And the reason I'm going to talk about this is because as I was thinking about this Congress and the proximity to the Super Bowl, at the same time in Philadelphia, we were transitioning coaches from a coach who had been there for a while, had done a good job, and was incrementally improving the team. He had a few superstars. He had, uh, he had a, a great uh, running back. He had a, uh, Michael Vick as the quarterback. He had Deshaun Jackson as the receiver. They were outstanding individuals. But a great football coach, Vince Lombardi, once said, individual commitment to a group effort. That is what makes teamwork. A company work, a society work, a civilization work, our ICUs work, he could have added. Chip Kelly came from the college ranks. He had a different philosophy and turned the Eagles and the NFL on its side when he first came in. He often says... Culture will beat scheme every day. What does he mean by that? Culture, a culture of winning, a culture of support, a culture of teamwork is extremely important. He got rid of the superstars. He traded LaShawn Jackson. He downgraded and eventually traded Michael Vick. And he put in place team members who are excellent athletes, but perhaps not the individual champions. He started putting out motivational books and forced the players to read them. 
He brought Malcolm Gladwell in and had him talk to them about Blink and the rapid recognition and acknowledgement of how we make decisions and why we make decisions. He helped them learn that the goal was to be a team and to win as a team, but to do it through football. And he took away all the other distractions. He created a fun and energizing way of practicing that was rigorous, but that was engaging. He changed the culture of that team. What is a champion? Well, we'll find out, I guess, in about 12 days. And Tom Brady, Russell Wilson, they're all incredible athletes. They work on great teams. But remember, when he came over, Michael Vick and Sean Jackson, who were hot-dogging a bit, he took that out. He no longer tolerates players who, after they make a great first down, take the ball and spin it and do a little shake because he wants them back on the line of scrimmage. He's decided they'll go with a no-huddle offense and that there's no time for the, for the uh, anecdotes. So culture and motivation, number one. Number two, sports science. What can we learn from sports science? Well, our, another of our founders, Max Harley Weil, once said, performing resuscitation without measuring the effects is like flying an airplane without an altimeter. If we can't measure it, we can't improve it. And so Chip Kelly brought in Sean Halls. Who's Sean Halls? Sean Halls is a sports scientist. He worked to train the elite SEALs in the Navy, and he used incredible technology to map out the acceleration and force, the torque, the activity level, and the sleep patterns, nutrition patterns of the soldiers. And he came to Philadelphia with Chip in order to apply that technology to the Philadelphia Eagles during practice and during games. So when you show up for training camp, you might look like this, but in fact, you have, between the shoulder blades on the back, you have a tool that is continuously measuring your EKG, your heart rate, your heart rate variability. It has a electrodes that are going up and measuring your EEG. It has an accelerometer, a ge geolocator, and it can tell you whether you're sitting down or standing up at practice. It can tell you where you are on the practice field, and it's continuously projecting that information to a control center in the NovaCare training center. But that's not it. When you go to do your workout, you are not only being monitored, but you're seeing your results. The display of how you are doing against yourself, against your other competitors, and how the team is doing in general is continuously displayed to you. Whether you're in the lunchroom, or whether you are at the, uh, at the weights, or whether you're out on the field. And by doing that, there's this continuous feedback in a display form that has meaning to the sharp end user that allows them to continuously improve their performance, but also to be yanked back from the brink of exhaustion, the brink of fatigue. Sound familiar? In our ICUs, we struggle with measuring and monitoring fatigue, exhaustion, distractibility. All of these things are possible and being used in the NFL today. Why aren't we using them in our ICUs? When you log in, when you swipe your badge at the NovaCare Center, it tells you how many reps you're going to do today on each of these machines in the weight room. And it tells you how, how much energy you should be using. And while it's monitoring that, it's feeding it back to the lunchroom. And then Sean, when he came with Chip, was disappointing to the, to the players. As one reporter reported, Players who grew accustomed to Taco Tuesdays and Fast Food Fridays will be disappointed. Chip Kelly has nixed all junk food this year, including pizza, chicken wings, fried food, and red meat. And in their place, they will eat lean protein and drink fruit smoothies. 
So based on the energy expenditure that they spend during that workout, they calculate the caloric needs, they know their body fat and muscle, and they are using that information in order to titrate their nutritional needs to the player. And that's uh, Nick Foles' uh, smoothie that you see up there. Each one of them personally made. Does that sound like something we should be doing for our patients in the ICU? We use REE. We use some crude calculations of our energy expenditure, but we don't do it, I think, as, ex as expertly as we can do in the National Football League. But physical fitness probably isn't enough. Physical fitness is definitely not enough because we know there are some tremendous athletes who still don't become champions on championship teams. And so an attention to the mental health and the mental preparedness in the same rigor is attempted. In fact, there is a focus on building confidence, attention control, energy management, and in particular, there's a lot of eye tracking software used in order to detect and squelch distractibility, noise, and try to funnel on the key things that that player needs to do in their role on that team. In fact, they have a very, very loud whistle, the loudest whistle in the world, military whistle, that they blow if a coach and a player are, not ta are talking for something other than X's and O's for five minutes during practice. They get up to five minutes to discuss something else, but at the five-minute mark, they have patrols who are blowing a whistle if they're not concentrating on the end in mind, the goal of what they're supposed to be working on. During lunch and dinner, they're grouped by their linebackers, defense, offense, linemen, etc., and they are viewing their statistics from the day to try to compare and improve. Does it sound like our quality improvement programs? Data collection, reporting and benchmarking, individual and organizational feedback into training and retraining that then gets remeasured on how we're doing. Perhaps we could do it better. Item number three that we could learn, perfect practice. Not just practice. When we practice, it needs to be how we play. Practice as we play, because that's what we will do when we face emergencies. You can see here the team practicing and identifying what they need to work on, but they're being videotaped, they're being watched. There's a fake official there who's trying to get in the way the same way that they get in the way they're simulating their environment. Vince Lombardi again said, practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice. Perfect practice makes perfect. And you can see here at the NovaCare Center, the bird's eye view, and all of them on the bottom right there walking through each other's roles. So the head coach, in this case, walking each of them through what all the other team members would be doing during the play so they can each understand what their role is in, the, in relationship to the others. I spend a lot of time doing this. But they have some really cool tools, too. Virtual reality. Four quarterbacks on the team. Each one of them is given a certain amount of time in the virtual simulator, which essentially is a 3D cave. In that cave, they take a thousand snaps. And they have to be, they're rushed by a number of different configurations of rushers. And they have to decide whether to throw the ball away to try to make the completion, take the sack, or try to run through a gap. And what they're doing is running that in slow motion. They run it in slow motion. When they get enough reps correct, they speed it up. And then they speed it up again, and they speed it up again until it's running faster than real life. So it's more challenging and more stressful than the real game situation. And then when they walk into the game and they have to perform, it seems easy. Everything's going in slow motion. They have these tools. And when they sit down to lunch, the four of them who are all competing for the number one quarterback slot, they can see how many reps they took versus their competitor. They can see how they did on each of the situations. And they can talk amongst themselves to figure out how they can do better. We do this to some extent. Here outside of the ICU, our senior fellows teaching our junior fellows, helping them with a skill, intubation, 
but we don't really capture and measure the results and feed it back in the same way that the NFL does. We practice in situ here with a team, with a real team, in the real environment, with a simulated baby, and we can glean some things, and we can debrief, and we can learn a lot from that. But perhaps there's more. We're not really tracking the heart rate, the variability, and the, uh, and the movement of the providers around the room. We're focused more on what's the heart rate of the simulated child. Here in the trauma bay, in a very similar situation, you can see the team at work, a simula simulated gunshot wound to the soul that's bleeding on the left shoulder. And we have some of those elements of realism that we can embed. But what we realize when we do these exercises is that communication, communication, number four, really, really important. What can we learn from a crowded stadium where there are thousands and thousands of fans screaming and yelling so that you can barely hear the count. And you need to change the formation with an audible. How are you going to communicate that? How do they do that? Well, the Eagles found out that they couldn't do it very well, but they focused on communication, and communication isn't always verbal. And they figured out ways that they could do of the nine top things that needed to be done to make a team work as a team should, communication, communication, communication kept on coming up as number one. So they developed a technique. If you see the Philadelphia Eagles on a Sunday, it looks really funny on the sideline. There's Chip Kelly in the center, and he's got about four or five or sometimes even six coaches who are all looking like monkeys, waving their hands and sending signals. And sometimes they even hold up placards that are... He converted them to Philadelphia placards. But they all have a message, and they all can be communicated from the sideline while all of the team is at the line where they're supposed to be. And they understand that that is a cue that they should be looking at coach number three, and they're giving the real signals, and the other guys are all distractions. But the entire team knows what's going on. Why do they do that? They do that because they use a no-huddle offense, item number five. A no-huddle offense is not necessarily a, hu a hurry-up offense. It's an offense that puts the offense on the, on the field, and it doesn't delay so that the other team can't set up. It requires a tremendous amount of teamwork, a tremendous amount of communication and practice to pull off. And Chip Kelly didn't invent it. It has been in use for many, many years. But he has perfected the movement in that the average number of minutes of actual action in an NFL game today is 11 minutes. 11 out of 60 minutes is actual activity. The rest are all pauses. And he recognized that. And he said, you know what? If we can run twice as many offensive plays as our competitors, we're going to score more points. And that's what I want to do. So he figured out how to get a mean of 22 seconds between plays when they're on offense. And no other team can come within two or three seconds of that. And those two or three seconds, when you add them up over a 60-minute game, make a great deal of difference, 20% more offensive plays than your opponent. Simply by being able to communicate as a team at the line and be able to audible without having to huddle. How much time do you spend huddling in your safety huddles in your ICUs every day? We're doing that more and more, more and more checklists, more and more incremental. They're not bad. They're important. But perhaps we need a disruptive innovation to get beyond that. What about instant replay? Boy, I wish I had instant replay in my ICU. I'd like to see myself. I'd like to see our team. I'd like to see what we could do better. Can you imagine if you had instant replay in your ICU, just like on the weekend, when you can see and see instantly after it happens, did he step out of bounds? Did he cross the line? Was the ball over the line? Did you know that in the red zone, near the end zone, there are 22 cameras around each end zone in the NFL? And they can 3D reconstruct. Even if there's a player blocking the view of the main camera, they can rotate and 3D reconstruct that so that you can get a good view and the officials can get a good view. And the inventor of that was 
attributed to Tony Verna in 1963, the inventor of instant replay, recently died. He wasn't the first. In 1955, there was a 30-second wet film where a hockey goal in Toronto could be played back in a minute. Wasn't very practical, didn't last. But over the next six years or so, slow motion was developed by Rune Aldrich and Kurt Gowdy, and they were able to play back a 70-yard run at halftime of a Boston College Syracuse game in 1961. They played it back at halftime. It was an instant. Oops. Could you go back for me? One slide. Thank you. In 1967, that was further. In 1963, that first instant replay was an Army-Navy touchdown in Philadelphia, a one-yard run. And he was able to play it back within a minute of that. An instant replay was born. Developed to instant slow motion, used by the Olympic skiers. Then, in 1982, a big breakthrough. John Madden, CBS chalkboard. The ability to rerun and have John Madden use electronic pencils to be able to write all over the place and impress people and discuss from a bird's eye view what was going on on the field. Boy, wouldn't that be nice to have in our ICUs. They've been doing it in football since 1982. In 1999, the technology got good enough that they could use it, and they allowed it to be used for NFL challenges from the press box. The fidelity of the, of the uh, image wasn't good enough for the, for the officials down on the field to be able to use it. And by 2001, Bird's Eye was developed by Dr. Hawkins, and they were using it for tennis, the K-Zone for baseball, the buzzer beater for uh, for basketball to see if the ball left the hand before the buzzer went off. And so the technology was getting better and better. By 2007, NFL high-definition uh, replays could be given to the referees on the field. And now in 2013, the NFL Matrix, after the technology that was used in the Matrix movies, was able to be translated to the football field so that a 360 degree reconstruction from 24 cameras could be rapidly assembled and as soon as that play was done rerun in the booth for you the viewers and the referees to be able to see no matter where they are within that red zone but they had to put rules in place just as you can imagine that if we were going to videotape and use instant replays in our ICUs there would be a lot of policies and procedures that would have to be adjusted medical legal issues, et cetera. So the NFL made their rules. These are the only things that instant replay can be used for. And they live by them and they die by them. We know last weekend when we were watching the playoffs that there were some very controversial calls that could have been um, reversed if they met those criteria. Instant replay. I think it's something we should think about. How about debriefing? We do use debriefing. We do know that it works in simulation training, in, uh, in many forms of psychological uh, care. But when we think about it, we think about it a little bit differently than the NFL. In the NFL, we have a coach in the press box or the coach box up there who's pre-screening and evaluating every player on every play. He's keeping an eye on the field, signaling down to the coach as to whether to throw the flag or not to request a replay. And they're scoring every player in their position electronically with pre predetermined metrics so that by the time the Philadelphia Eagle player finishes the game, showers and dresses, and gets on the bus or the plane or the train after the game, they have a personalized film of their performance, of every play that they were a key player in, and a rating that they don't look at until they see the film and self-rate how they did. And then they compare their self-ratings with how the expert coach rated them, and they get a score. They get a score for every play. And then they get an overall score. And then they get a score for how their group, their linebacker group, their linemen, receivers, whatever they're a group of, they get a team score also. And they don't get punished. They, get, they discuss it. They try to understand 
why they did or didn't perform to their expectations. A different philosophy, a different culture. So they even figured out on their team plane that the seating arrangements didn't work. They have swivel seats and they can sit as a team so that the coach can sit and the linebackers can face each other so they have time on the plane back where they can actually debrief on their performance. Form, fitting, function. Well, we know that we have some tools in our armamentarium. Here are resuscitation tools that can provide real-time feedback. We can provide some just-in-time training. We can do some performance debriefing. And we do it more in simulation than we do in real life. Perhaps we should be, now that we have telemedicine systems, this is a picture of OnStar Online from GM, where they have surveillance of the cars out there. Other industries are doing this. And we have telemedicine that potentially could track and train and perhaps become an operation center. We should think about how we can use this. And actually, at 3.15, when we break out into a panel discussion, we have the chairman of the telemedicine committee who's going to give their thoughts about how we could move forward with these types of initiatives. Number eight of 10, celebration. This could have been cheerleaders, but I've changed it to celebration because it was a little risky to do it the other way. But we have to take time to celebrate. How often in our units do we move from a sad moment or a happy moment and keep on going as a team? We're busy, we're distracted, there's too much work to do in the day. There's a certain amount of celebration that's therapeutic, there's a certain amount that builds teamwork. And the Eagles are trying to figure out how to titrate that. They don't allow and they don't want these massive dancing celebrations and pileups. They want to move on with the game, but they want to celebrate with their fans when something really great happens. And so they struggle with this balance. And you can see the high fives. And in the bottom right, in the little triangle, in the little box, you may not be able to see it. But during a play, actually this was during a touchdown catch, while the two receivers were crossing, they low-fived each other on the way over. They were having fun during the game and celebrating in a way that was constructive and not destructive. Number nine, fantasy and simulation. Fantasy football has taken off. It is widespread. It is disseminated. It is gamified. The real statistics from real players in real games is instantly transmitted. Their injury report, you know it in, fa in fantasy football before they're practically in the locker room. And the fan base has greatly expanded. And so the involvement of the couch potato, of the non-athlete with the National Football League has astronomically increased. They found a disruptive innovative technique to really involve people outside of the, the catchment that they had of the people who wanted to go to the games or watch on TV. It's become a game. John Madden football, number 25. It's version 25 now. Better and better. Virtual reality where you can actually get into the game, where you can play against people you don't even know across the world if you want to. And why don't we have games? We have virtual reality, we have simulation. We've not really learned how to engage the public. And perhaps with the Thrive Initiative, perhaps with getting out there amongst our survivors and their families, we will develop a way to make critical care interesting, important, and perhaps engage the next generation of providers to become involved and learn about critical care. Finally, number 10, resilience. Back to the snowball and Shady McCoy, who had an unbelievable game. But the reason he did that, the reason he attributes his incredible game that day under adverse conditions that he had never experienced previously was because he stuck to the game plan and he allowed the team to provide the information. They didn't huddle, but they were able to figure out 
that some of the players on the other team, some of the, some of the linemen, really weren't performing as they had expected them to on the opposite team, that they were cold, perhaps favoring, not quite as swift, not quite as steady, and they were able to have the linemen communicate to the running back that, come my way, we got you, and he was able to respond both with the measured response and a few little acts of championship brilliance on that day. So let's reflect. How could we take this information? How could we use what, what we know about sports science in the NFL and bring it to critical care? Should we, shouldn't we? We know that an NFL team is very different from the one million teams that we have to assemble in order to take care of our patients in the ICU. It's completely different. But what's real and what's not? What can we use, what can we learn from that industry? We know that when we go from what we know in the literature through those Olympic rings of guidelines, medical science, training to what we teach, learn, and remember, and then when we measure what we actually do at the bedside, we are not doing that well. We need some disruptive technology. We need deliberate practice and quality improvement. We need to do those things that will incrementally improve our care, but we also need a quantum leap. We need something that will take us to the Super Bowl. And I think it's going to be teamwork. How are we going to do this? There's only a few ways that we can do it. We can't do it all at once. Maybe, you, maybe we can talk about some of the elements of these 10 items that we could do today and now. We have to train the individual, we have to train the team, and we have to train the environment. And I think that the NFL has some good ideas about how we might move in those directions. Perhaps our EICUs and our, our uh, telemedicine setups will look much more like this NASA control center in monitoring and helping our patients, being there as support, monitoring, teaching, training, and improving our science because we're continuously learning from what we do with technology that is emerging and innovative. Are we ready for football? I don't know if we're ready for the whole thing. I don't know if we're ready for the Super Bowl yet, but I hope that perhaps you're ready and willing to think about what a team can do. These are many members of the team that I get to work with every day, and I appreciate that very much. We're working towards it. I hope you will too. And I hope that for the rest of the afternoon, you might think a little bit about how we take a team of champions and we convert them together to a championship team. Thank you.